My name is Dr. Julia Iyashira. I'm the executive director of the Dalio Center for Health Justice at New York Presbyterian and senior vice president for health justice and equity. And I am joined today by a beloved friend and colleague, Dr. Olajide Williams. We're here today in Morningside Heights, not too far from one of our campuses. Thank you so much for joining us today. So, Dr. Williams, I've known you for over a decade. Your expertise has really elevated the work at New York Presbyterian into a comprehensive stroke center. So can you tell me a little bit more, what ignited your passion in this space? So 1997, when I was doing my internship, uh, was also the year that the FDA approved tissue plasminogen activator, the TPA, which is the clot-busting medication for stroke. This was one of the most important breakthroughs uh, in neurology, period. Mm -hmm. I mean, stroke at that time was the second largest killer in America. And, um, and so the fact that we had a treatment that could potentially reverse disability from stroke was huge. Okay. I know that you are extremely passionate about not only identifying disparities in stroke, but addressing them. You know, African-Americans um, are, are twice as likely to die from stroke uh, than, than white Americans. When an African-American is between the age of 35 and 45, they are four times as likely to die from stroke as their white counterparts. Presenting this data without context is dangerous. Absolutely. And, and it can propagate biases. Why do African-Americans have such worse mortality mm -hmm. from stroke than their white counterparts? And the answer to that question does not lie in our genes, does not lie in our biology. Correct. It lies in the social determinants of health. And unless we address them at the fundamental levels, we really won't be able to address the disparities that we've been seeing in stroke. This is the work and the, the work that I am passionate about in the Dalio Center. Yes. How do we start to move these interventions, yes. not just in the hospital, Absolutely. but into the community? I think community health workers um, are the future mm -hmm. of community engagement, of a lot of the work that um, hospitals do in communities. They go to the patient's home. They go, they're in the patient's church. And it's so important to meet people where they are. Yes. If they really want to reduce the disparities in their surrounding communities that are suffering. Where are you seeing the greatest success with community health workers in terms of the ability to impact the risk factors of stroke? I, I uh, founded the uh, community health worker training program at Manhattanville campus of Columbia back in 2016. Mm -hmm. The center trains a community health worker across an eight week uh, program. About 210 community health wow. workers from about 52 churches. That's amazing. Um, they've screened over 30,000 people for high wow. blood pressure. They have referred over 5,000 uh, people into the medical system. They've enrolled thousands of people into health insurance plans. And community health workers that we've found can play a, a critical role in supporting uh, that process for our patients uh, who are being discharged from MYP, helping to support the transitional care. We recently looked at some of our data in the post-hospitalization work that our, our community health workers have been doing and the impact that they are having on these patients and their lives and their families is nothing short of spectacular. You've chosen a really unique and universal medium to spread the word in health literacy, music. Music is one of the most powerful resources in the world. Mm -hmm. it, there's music centers on both the left and our right hemispheres. Music occupies twice as much real estate in our brains than language itself. Mm. It can help you remember things mm -hmm. that allows us to connect right. with the individual in a way that makes health literacy uh, a fun activity. People with low health literacy have a 54% higher risk of death. I don't think you can get to health equity without passing through health literacy. Mm -hmm. So I want to know more about your organization, Hip Hop Public Health. So I actually founded the organization with a gentleman known as Dougie Fresh. Oh, I don't know who he is. <laughs> 
And um, this primary mission is actually is to, is to use music, which is the form of art, culture, and, and science to improve health literacy for young people and their families. We're a big believer in using mnemonics within hip hop songs because of the rhyme, the rhythm, and the beat really allows us to really express ourselves during the, the teaching of that mnemonic. Mm -hmm. And so we thought we could make children stroke literate so they could recognize the signs and the symptoms of stroke. They recognize the urgency of those symptoms that, uh, that there's a four and a half hour window. And they also recognize that 911 activating the emergency medical system. And so how we did it was that we basically created a song, but at the heart of the song was the mnemonic. It was the FASD mnemonic, mm -hmm. you know, say F stands for facial droop, um, arm stands for arm weakness, S stands for speech di disturbance, and T is time to call 911. And so what was remarkable was that we found that those kids that we made stroke literate mm -hmm. effectively taught their parents yes. and their grandparents wow. who also became stroke literate. And that translated into reduced delays to the hospital and also increased uh, use of the clot buster medication. And so you know, we truly believe that there is a, a, a major role that music can play in, in health literacy interventions. So what would you say to other physicians who are interested in this space, who also want to work on addressing the social determinants of health? I think we should look at it as, as, as what can I do in my space, in my practice, to help further this mission. Mm -hmm. The New York Presbyterian has been um, incredibly supportive. I've been very fortunate uh, to be in an environment where we align at all levels when it comes to the urgency of addressing health inequity. We must sustain our trust building efforts because by building trust through transparency, through cultural sensitivity, I truly believe it is through these processes that that we are trying to champion, that we will be able to move the needle forward. Change happens at the speed of trust. And so it's gonna take perhaps even a generation to truly close the gap. I'm gonna take that with me today, that change happens at the speed of trust. Dr. Williams, it was a pleasure talking with you today. I know that we all look forward to hearing what you do next in the pursuit of health justice. <laughs>